In New York City recently, a police officer took this photograph of an unusual animal. He didn't recognize it. He brought it to the attention of some wildlife experts. And indeed, it turned out to be an unusual animal, uh, at least for such an urban environment, called a fisher. Uh, not really sure exactly what a fisher is. The animal is relatively new to me. I'm Brian Mallow from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I've asked one of our scientists, Roland Kays, uh, director of our biodiversity lab and a mammologist, to talk to us about this. So, Roland, hello. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Really good. <laughs> good to speak to you uh, at this vast distance in different parts of our museum. <laughs> So, uh, what, what is a fisher? Um, that's not an animal that most of us are that familiar with. Yeah, well, a fisher is uh, basically a big weasel, and one important thing to get out of the way early, right away is it, it doesn't eat fish. It doesn't fish. It's just a, it's a bad name. Um, it's a terrible name. It, it's, it's one of the largest members of the weasel family. Uh, you might think of it as a small wolverine if you're familiar with wolverines. They're not quite that big. But, you know, they can be uh, 10, 15 pounds. And um, they are uh, predators. They hunt small, medium-sized uh, mammals, especially, and some birds. Um, they're from North America. And the really interesting thing is they have really nice fur. And so for hundreds of years, fur trappers and, and hunters uh, you know, really trapped them out. So there were almost certainly fishers in Manhattan you know, 400 years ago. But there are actually no records because they were trapped out so quickly. Um, and they were driven out and driven out and driven out so that they only survived in a small little part of the Adirondack Mountains in New York State, really in the wilderness, um, until about the 1930s. And finally, there was some protection give them t given to them. Um, there were a few re reintroductions, and the population started recovering slowly. And then um, in the early 2000s, they started actually really taking off and started being found actually in suburban areas. Uh, living kind of you know out in the outskirts of towns, which was surprising given that they were thought to be a real wilderness species. But they were moving more and more into cities, and now this example of a fisher actually in the Bronx is kind of mind blowing. Um, that that a predator that used to be considered an, a, a real wilderness species actually showed up in the Bronx. Is this like a tiger or lion being found? Maybe it's not as large, but it's just unusual to find this animal in the city. Uh, well, and a predator as well. That a that a predator yeah. would be would be in there, um, uh, you know, walking around, caught at six in the morning by this uh, by this police officer on film because he recognized, you know, he'd seen the rats, he'd seen raccoons, he'd seen all the common animals there. This is something he'd never seen before. Totally different. Okay, it's not a raccoon. It's not a ferret. It looked kind of like a heavy set ferret or something. <laughs> it is kind of a heavy set ferret, but but really big. Um, and uh, we can tell. So this is a great example of you know if, if he just called me up and told me, hey, I, I, I saw a fisher. I don't know if I would have believed him, but the fact that he got this picture means that, you know, myself and other, uh, other wildlife experts can look at it and confirm, yes, that is definitely a fisher. It's too big for a mink. Um, it's the wrong color for a ferret, and it's bigger than a ferret. Uh, it's 100% fisher. So um, hopefully I'm sharing this other image yeah. of uh, a friend of yours. Oops. I wonder why it's doing that. Yeah, Are you saying it? Yeah, that's Bernard the fisher, and he's being held by... Uh, grad student named Scott LaPointe, who uh, did his PhD with me. This is a suburban fisher. Actually, this was in, in, in Albany. This was the biggest fisher we got. He was uh, six kilos, which is um, pretty big, about you know, 12, 15 pounds. Um, and he was uh, sleeping in a, uh, he would sleep during the daytime in, um, in a kind of a pile of brush behind uh, someone's house in, uh, in, in the Albany pine bush. Excellent. So that's that's a larger than average. That's the biggest one you've seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but but really, how weird is this? Um, we see raccoons and squirrels. There's all all animals are wildlife animals, aren't they? And and just because we see so many birds, dogs and cats, rats, uh, uh, squirrels and raccoons so often, but they're wild like raccoons. Maybe everyone doesn't see raccoons. I used to live by Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, and they would. Apparently, they're in the park, but they would come down our street sometimes. So how unusual, um, so what? We see Well, I think this is interesting because you, you've mentioned a lot of urban wildlife, and there is a lot of ur urban wildlife, especially herbivores and omnivores, right? Things that eat plants or things that eat kind of anything. So rats will eat any garbage we stick out there. Raccoons eat garbage. They eat 
um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll prey on frogs and, and minnows and stuff like that, but they're not really very predaceous. So what's really interesting, I think, across America, what we're seeing is really the return of predators into suburban and, in some cases, urban areas. And this is interesting. It's, it's really good news, I think, overall, unless you're a rabbit, because these rabbits and these squirrels have been living in urban area, basically using humans like shields. Uh, not predators, having to worry about predators. They don't have, they, exactly. If they could avoid getting hit by the car, right. and they could dine on our nice grass and all the gardens we plant out there, they had a pretty good life. Well, the predators, just like you know, evolution, eventually fills these vacuums. They're starting to evolve and change and starting to move into, into more of these urban areas. So they'll explore any area, and it's great if they can find their own ecological niche, if they can find uh, a source of food that isn't being exploited by all their competitors. Uh, that would be a good reason for them to, to explore an area, like an urban area. Like right. So you know, some of these urban areas have, have tons of prey. You see rabbits, squirrels all over the place. Um, that's out of balance, really. Mm. You know, and predators can return the balance of nature to an area. Um, so the, the big question with these fishers, so this is one fisher, right? It's not a population. They're not uh, you know, breeding yet in, in the Bronx. Um, but if they did, if they could figure it out, if they could find places to sleep during the day, manage to run around at night and not get hit by cars, I know that they would start eating rats. And that could be really interesting because yeah. obviously New York City rats need a predator. There's way <laughs> too many of them, and they're running free. They're living you know, this life of eating garbage and not having any predators. Um, the domestic cats just aren't doing it, but weasels are, you know, fa uh, fishers are really a vicious predator. They're known to control prey populations in other parts of the range. So if they start eating these rats, I think it could be really interesting to see if they can actually uh, maybe provide the rat control that's uh, so badly needed in the city. You mentioned rats and rabbits. What about dogs and cats, small dogs, small cats? I mean, and, and humans, uh, would, could fishers, would you be concerned if this started happening more often, that they would be a threat to any of those animals? Us, no, I mean, well, pet. okay, so first of all, let's talk about chihuahuas. You know, any carnivore, they, the chihuahuas, are, they're so small and ratty, they're going to be on the menu of anything. But Especially if you that, like Mexican food. Yeah. <laughs> fishers fishers um, are not likely to mess with dogs. Uh, cats, no. we don't know. Uh, they're in the size range that fishers sometimes can attack, um, and there are records people say, a fisher attacked my cat. Um, now, I think coyotes and great horned owls are much more likely to attack a fisher, uh, to attack a cat than a fisher is, but it is possible. We've done some studies on fisher diet in suburbia, uh, looked at scats, looked at some road, uh, stomachs contents of some roadkill animals, and um, we haven't found any cats. Other people have done some studies, they haven't found any cats, you know, really in the diet. So if they're eating cats, it doesn't happen very often. Um, but who knows? Like I said, these animals are changing, they're evolving, so uh, it's hard to say for sure about the cats. You know, generally, if you love your cat, you know, I, I, I recommend keeping them indoors because uh, they're a lot safer, they live, ha live happier lives there, and fishers may or may not be one of the reasons for that. Now, this uh, is an interesting single event with a fisher, but recently, here in Raleigh, uh, a bear was spotted really close to downtown, like surprisingly close, in a friend of ours neighborhood. And uh, and you've told me that another bear was spotted in the D.C. area near the National Institutes of Health. Um, and, and also, I just came from Chicago where I hear there are sometimes coyotes in the city. Yeah. So, so is this, is this, it's almost, uh, interesting that the new Planet of the Apes movie is about to come out because we have, is, is this just a result of how much habitat loss that that since we've encroached upon so much wild habitat is that why we're seeing uh, no, it's more than that because we we push these animals out a long time ago and this is some of these animals coming back on their own terms um, but the the two examples you gave the coyotes and the bears are actually different examples um, so the the bears are wandering through they're dispersing animals young you know teenagers they're basically kicked out of the home they don't know where to go so they they wander around. They don't have a map of Raleigh and say, hey, I want to go into this neighborhood. They're just, you know, they would rather go into the natural areas. They just don't know where to go. And sometimes they kind of wander down a creek or whatever, and they end up in suburbia. So that's what happened with the bears. Now, the, the uh, coyotes in Chicago are another story. They are living in urban areas. They're living in the parks. And then there are also some animals that are really living in the urban areas in the neighborhoods and even in, in the loop of Chicago, which is amazing. They're breeding there. 
That's the difference. Now, this fisher is probably more like the bear for now, right? It's a dispersing animal that's wandering in. Now, bears are not going to be able to make a living in Raleigh. It's just not going to fit. There's not enough food for them. There's not enough places for them to go. They can't sneak around. Fishers in the Bronx, they might be able to make a living. Because of the prevalence of rats and... Well, because of, the, because of their prey, right? So squirrels and rats, plenty of those there. They should be able, be able to make a living there. The other thing is fishers are very nocturnal. So even though New York's a city that never sleeps, you know, there's a lot less activity. There's less car traffic. And the other thing is that fishers are very good at going into tunnels and living underground. So they can go into small little holes and sleep during the day and seek refuge. They can also climb trees. So if you want to live in New York City, you don't want to be running around on the sidewalks all the time. You want to either be able to go underground or up into a tree um, and sleep and hide out. And so they have the potential to do that where a bear would never be able to do that in the Bronx. Even coyotes, you know, they're seen in the Bronx sometimes, but I think it's harder for them just because they're so much bigger to hide out. Um, in fact, the police officer I talked to who saw the fisher, he said it was, it was running underneath the cars that were parked okay. on the side of the road, which I think is really cool because it's like that's like this movement corridor. They, they, they're, you know, they're underneath the cars is pretty safe. They're hidden. It's uh, kind of hidden. It's kind of like a tunnel that they yeah. could be using. So, you know, if that turns out to be true, uh, you know, if that's something that they, they learn how to navigate the city using maybe the sewers and the subway tunnels and running underneath cars at night that are parked, um, you know, they could really get their way around and, and um, put, a, put a real terror into the rat population. Wow. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. You, one thing, uh, maybe one final thing, you just contrasted coyotes and bears that you, you said that you probably wouldn't see and I'm, I'm sorry, you were contrasting the, Bronx, the New York with Chicago. Like coyotes are in, in the city of Chicago, um, but you didn't think you would see that in New York. Is it for the lack of parks? or well, like what's, it, No, what's it, it could. So, so Chicago probably does have a few more parks um, connected, but also they've had coyotes a lot longer. Okay. So um, what we're seeing really with these carnivores returning to urban America is, is evolution. And evolution, you know, we think about it taking millions of years. It doesn't need to take that long, but it does take some time. And the thing about coyotes is um, they're not native to the east. They've been in Chicago and in the grasslands in the middle of the country for, for, for many hundreds and millions of years. But they've only moved east in the last 50 years or so. So there haven't been any coyotes in New York City um, until the last few decades, uh, really. Um, and so it's going to take them a while to learn to adapt to learn how to cross the roads, to learn how to live so close to people. So I think it's going to be harder for them. You know, it's happened in Chicago, so chances are it could also happen in New York, but I think it's going to take a little while. Fishers, I think um, there are no urban fishers, so will they really become urban? I mean, they're, they're suburban, so they're getting there. Will, how long will it take? Will they be able to do that? Um, you know, one risk still is getting hit by cars. The other thing, if they do start eating rats is, um, you know, a lot of times in the cities people poison rats, that rat poison can bioaccumulate in the rats, and then the fishers eat the rats, and every rat they eat increases their dose, and it could cause them trouble uh, in that regard. So, you know, there's a lot of unknowns here. I think it's fun to make hypotheses and, and see what happens uh, going forward with these fishers. Yeah, well, thank you very much for helping provide some context for this. Uh, Dr. Roland Kays, in addition to being director of our biodiversity lab here at the museum, here's a professor over at NC State. And uh, I'm Brian Mallow, and we're coming from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh. Thank you Great. very much. Thanks for having me. See you later.